This is the Ballpark Digest Broadcaster Chat. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler, fresh haircut, with Mick Gillespie and Kevin Reichard. First, Mick, how are you? Doing great, man. Good to see you with a fresh haircut. Uh, you know, I've had one since quarantine time, but, you know, being down here in Fairhope, you know, the cradle of writers, you got to let your stuff go, man. You just can't, you, you can't have the trim, you know? <laughs> let the inspiration flow like your hair. Kevin Reichard of Ballpark Digest, it appears that we will have a Major League Baseball season. It, it does appear so. After three months of negotiations, Major League Baseball and the Players Association up, ended up at exactly the same point they were at March 26th. Talk about taking the long road to a, to a uh, final agreement. So, from what we know and what we've heard, players would report July the 1st in terms of just getting their bodies, getting everything warmed up once again for baseball. And then around about the July 20s, around about July 24th and thereabouts, we would see a season begin. Yes, that's the terms that we are hearing. Uh, teams will train at their home ballparks. That's not been formally announced yet, although the Yankees and Mets did announce it. And why they did and no one else did is still sort of a mystery to me. So the teams will be at their home ballparks, except for Toronto, and that's still to be worked out. They will train there until the beginning of the season. Um, so there's logistical issues with finding housing in the local market, things like that. But that's something that teams have been anticipating for a while. So we still have the final Players Association uh, response due today by 5 p.m., but we basically have an idea. Mick, what was your response yesterday when you heard? Well, I mean, I'm still a little skeptical. Um, you know, I hope that it all works out. I mean, the, you know, we're in that process right now where the players union has to agree you know like you guys were talking about on the date and the you know the coronavirus um, guidelines but there's still this kind of thing floating out there you know do the players come back and then you know do they do they try to sue over the the terms that are kind of set up right now the money and I guess that's kind of what I'm waiting to see you know and I, I don't I, 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 it's hard to kind of anticipate how this is going to go, but if the players, if the players try to take this to arbitration, the money part of it, they're going to damage baseball because we're not going to have a season most likely. And um, what I'm finding out is that a lot of people were just getting fed up with the, with the entire baseball process of, of the, the negotiations between the, you know, the owners and the players. What, what I will say, though, is if, if, if they get out and start playing and the 60 games go well, you get into the playoffs, I think people will, will forgive them because they, we love the game, right? But I'm, I'm just a little bit hesitant to get excited and say, hey, we got baseball coming. And, and I hope I'm, again, like I've said for weeks, I hope I'm wrong and I hope that we have some games, uh, you know, in, in July, like it's being reported is a possibility. So that's what Mick is waiting and seeing on. Kevin, how about you? You know, I'm less concerned about the grievance process than I am, than, than Mick is mainly because as the husband of a lawyer who deals with this stuff all the time, it'll take months for a grievance to be heard, much less decided. So we won't see that process play out until the off season uh, and maybe just in time for negotiations for 2021. So everyone's sort of kicking the can down the road. Um, so I, I do expect play to happen. I don't expect a lot of roadblocks in terms of the, uh, the protocols for the testing and for uh, the other things that the two sides have agreed upon, such as a universal DH this year, such as the 10th inning, put a man on second rule, which I'm actually for because I, I'm not a huge fan of 15 inning games. I'm, I'm, I'm just not. Uh, and I think the rules around that are, are really fascinating. And let's talk about that for a second, because obviously you two must have seen a game or two with uh, the 10th inning beginning with the player on second. As a now, it's a result of an error, isn't it? So no one could give up an earned run uh, and lose the game in this situation. They can lose the game, but not with an earned run. Right. If that runner scores, that run is unearned. Um, Mick, I'll go first. When I was first introduced to this rule, I rebelled mentally against it. This is not the baseball that I know. What I really appreciated about it was I went in with this feeling of, okay, runner at second, 
bunt him over, get him in, one run is in, and then the same thing happens the bottom half. And that didn't happen. What happened instead is in the top half, teams swung away for a big inning. So you could knock that guy in and suddenly you had a multi-run rally ready because the door was wide open. Inning would start with a single and you had a run in and another guy and now you're really looking to pile it on. Or the very first batter of the inning doesn't get the guy over. He strikes out, he pops up. Well, now the pitcher understands he just bears down on the next hitter. And even if that guy does move the runner over with a grounder, something like that, now you got two outs, runner at third, you get him, you're walking off. It's a virtual certainty that you're going to score that run in the bottom half. So there was immediate excitement. There was all sorts of thrills in terms of how are they going to play this? Where are you in the lineup? Is that runner at second base fast? So I found it to be very compelling the more that I saw of it. And I saw that it, it did end games early which was the point of it. What it was supposed to do was not let games go into the 13th, the 14th, the 15th. Whereas before I would see teams, you'd get up there and you'd see guys in the 10th, the 11th, swinging for the home run to win the game. And so the innings would just pass. This game's ended in the 10th, the 11th inning, and you were done. Mick, what was your experience? Yeah, I wasn't a fan, um, and I'm a baseball purist. And I guess as a former player, too, you know, not a major league player, but someone that played a lot of games. Like, I, I just like idea of, like, I show up and there's a guy at second base. And I remember talking about game scenarios where, you know, there's a guy at second, and then he steals third, right, before pitch is thrown. And then you walk the next two guys, not by throwing four pitches, but by pointing to load the bases, right? And now you got the bases loaded and not one pitch has been thrown, right? And, I mean, that's just baseball situations, right? I think there was a game one time where the first pitch was a wild pitch and the guy got the third. And then, you know, you walk the next two guys because you got to load the bases, you know, like the, you, want, you want the double play or whatever. Um, and I, I don't know. That, that's just to me is that's not how the game is supposed to work. You're supposed to earn the bases, right? And so you, you, you put the guy at second base is supposed to, to get there because he earned it, not because he was the last out of the inning before, right? Uh, but, you know, sometimes I feel like uh, in our country right now, there's a lot of people that are at second base because they got the gift of second base and didn't get a double, but they think they did, you know? And <laughs> it's like you've got these games that are like, you know, like you said, like you, you've got bases loaded, and one pitch has been thrown, you know, in certain situations. So I, I just, I, I don't know. I, I, I like the idea of getting the games over because sometimes extra innings take a long time. But the, the you know, the concept of, okay, here's a guy that's at second base. And then, and then sometimes, you know, first pitch guy singles the center field runner scores, you know. The, the one thing I will say is that I've, I've been a, I, I'm, I'm an old curmudgeon when it comes to baseball, you know, like I'm a baseball purist and, and I like to see like the fundamentals of the game that I feel like we're kind of lacking right now uh, overall. I mean, just the, the play itself. I mean, you know, why is it that guys can't hit through the shift? It's because they don't know how to use the entire field anymore. You know, like you, you do that back in the 60s and they'll just hit it where you're not because you were taught to use the whole field. You know, like you, you, you could place the ball where we can't place it. Everybody wants to hit a home run. And, what, and why I'm saying that is you get into the situation where the guy's at second, you expect, well, like, like you mentioned, Jesse, I'm going to bunt him the third, I'm going to hit a sacrifice fly and bring him in. But what I saw was that most teams in the Southern League, which is, you know, a pretty high level of baseball, did not have enough skilled batters to do that. Like, I saw way, way too many strikeouts in these spots or teams that didn't want to, to bunt the guy over. They bunt the ball back to the pitcher. And what was, you know, kind of surprising to me was if I'm managing or if I'm a farm director and I'm watching any of these games and I'm, I'm, that are in extra innings with the guy at second and, I, and my team is unable – to do the fundamentals right to get that guy in, you would figure the next day we're going to be out bunting and we're going to be out, you know, practicing making contact. And I didn't see a lot of that. And I'm not just talking about the Smokies. I'm just talking about in general, you know. So um, it, it, it was a big advantage if you got to the bottom of the inning because you had a runner at second base, you know, it, it would end the game. But, but all in all, you know, me personally, I, I would just prefer that, 
you earn those game the, the runs. And I, I even feel like this. If you're going to do that, how about we just set the 11th inning, and if, if there's no leader in the 11th or 12th, we just have a tie and move on. It's not a win. It's not a loss. It's, it's a tie. That, to me, would be a better scenario than putting a runner at second base and allowing a team to win the game on a run that the guy didn't earn to get on base, if that makes any sense. Let me focus on something else, too. So you focused on hitting. Let me focus on pitching. I think that some people might be of the belief that this is being installed because, hey, we don't want games to go on too long. We need to have games shorter. I'm of the belief that this was installed at the minor league level specifically because there's not enough pitching. We can't have position players pitching. There's a chance for injury. We can't be using our starters in extra innings. There is such a lack of pitching. There's such a worry as the season goes on. Football, a chief concern is concussions. Football, a chief concern is injury. That the natural playing of the game, guys get hurt. It's, it's simply a physical, violent game. Baseball, the central thrust of baseball is that you have to have a pitcher. But they're so worried about these pitchers and their arm health that they don't want these guys, that, the metaphor used is bullets in the gun. A guy only has so many bullets in a gun. And so you can't wear that guy's arm away in the minor leagues, especially as youngsters are trying to throw as hard as they can and trying to spin the ball as well as they can, really putting stress on that arm. So I see at the single A level, them trying to do everything they can not to cause any wear and tear on a pitcher. So because of that, starters go fewer innings. Inning limit, pitch limit, oh, we've gotten to the end of the game. What can we do to stop the game from going longer? So I think that that is a central question that baseball really has to ask itself. It's the hitters and all the different things that hitters need to do. But the question of taking care of pitching arm health, especially if Major League Baseball wants to compress a season, like minor league baseball compresses, you're going to end up with a lot of arm injuries. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, uh, sorry, Kevin, just to jump in too, Jesse, because I've thought about this a lot. You know, like I've been uh, – and there's people – we'll sit, put it like this. There's people – that just take the Cubs. I mean, that's, you know, who I've been around and, and watched their organization. And, and they're so worried about the health of someone throwing a baseball that they've developed zero pitchers, zero. And they have the, one of the best and brightest guys to ever run an organization at Theo Epstein. And at the end of the day, he's the boss. And it's, and, and that's the tough part about being a hall of famer and being great is that on the other side, when things don't go well, it falls on your doorstep, right? the fact that the Cubs can't develop any pitching. They haven't. They just haven't. Since he's been there, they haven't. And the one thing that I've noticed that's been different from him and, and the Jim Hendry era is that, 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 that they're so concerned about guys not pitching, and they're not pitching, and they're not pitching innings, and they're not pitching games. And you're right. You get into extras, and there's no one available. Last year, you know, just with the Smokies, and I'm not sure how it was with the rest of them, I can think of maybe four, five, six games – where they just didn't have any pitching, you know, like where they, they would throw a position player in, in, in the game in extra innings or sometimes not even in extra innings, maybe the double header in the seventh, you know, something like that. Like a guy throwing 50 miles an hour to, to go out there and lob batting practice because, you know, they don't value the game enough to put somebody in that's paid to pitch. And, and the reason why is that they value the player and the player's health more than they value the actual game itself. Right. And then you start to, once you do that, then now, now you've, you've said to your players, hey, look, guess what? You know, your health is more important than us going out and, and winning the game, okay? I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but what I'm telling you is that in my time in the minor leagues, it wasn't like that when I first started. The game always meant more than, than the players. Winning the game was why you were in there to play, right? Um, but you're exactly right, you know? That's why they instituted it in the minor leagues. And I felt like, look, it would if, if you're so worried about the about people pitching in this game that you're supposedly a professional in right that you don't you don't want to you, you know that one drop of rain and everybody's like hey let's bang it and go home right which is crazy to me like you're here to play this game right wouldn't you want to stick around and play through rain you know what you want to play in extra innings and, and they used to do that you know they used to have like a starter that was like the fifth guy and he just you know, he had to throw a bullpen that day. And, you know, you get into like the, 
tenth inning and you got you know your bullpen and the minor leagues is out. You got the starter from you know it's got to throw two innings anyway in the bullpen. Let's just throw him in the game and let him pitch. Was is that why everybody was getting hurt? You know, was there was I don't know. I just know that when I saw organizations in the past, they developed pitchers that were good in the major leagues, and these guys pitched, you know. But if, if, if we're so concerned about pitching, instead of giving games away by putting a guy at second, I just feel like, like I said before, like just, just hey, we're going to play nine innings, like a spring training game or ten innings, and if it's not, if it's not decided – you just have that third column and, and, and go on. But you're exactly right. And sorry, Kevin, for jumping in there. No problem. I was just, I was just going to point out that there's that, that so many organizations have so huge an investment in, in pitching. And, you know, I think you'll remember back to the, the era of the Cubs drafting these broad shouldered big pitchers, you know, and look at what happened to the colleagues of a Thomas diamond blew out his arm as a, as a cub starter. So, you know, I think there's a lot of institutional issues going on with uh, the desire to preserve pitchers as long as possible. Not everyone's a Burt Blylevin, you know, not everyone's Burt Not Blylevin. only that, the, the big attraction right now with pitchers is, right, your spin rate, um, but especially big velocity. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think we understand with young pitchers throwing harder and harder and spinning the ball more and more, what kind of stress that is doing on their elbow, on their shoulder. It, I would be very interested to see how many young pitchers aren't getting hurt, how many young pitchers are staying healthy all the way up. Because my general thinking is, if you've got a pitching prospect, it's only a matter of time before the guy has to undergo the knife. That's, that's just been my experience. Well, part of it too is 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 actually like the the physical way that you throw a baseball, right? I mean, like like you know, if if you're out there doing it and you're not putting as much stress on your arm, I don't think that it's as the it's the amount of innings that you're throwing. It's how you're throwing those innings. I guess that you know the argument is well, when you get tired, and this is true, when when you get tired, you know, your body tends to cheat. And then the minute you're dropping your elbow, instead of kind of staying up here, you're dropping it. It's changing where the pressure is on your arm and, and, and things are happening, right? That bad things can happen. And I mean, I, 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 you know, I get that argument too. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, I mean, if like you're paid to, to, to pitch a baseball, you know, I mean, like that's, that's kind of what you got to do. You know, we're, we're paid to talk about the game and it's like, hey, let's talk about it, right? Yeah. So all this coming up because Major League Baseball looking at potentially instituting that like the universal DH. There's something, Mick, that you said earlier that I want to come back to. But first, my concern, we went through each of your concerns. My concern was over the weekend, we heard about the coronavirus breakout in the Phillies camp. We heard that they had shut things down in Florida. We know that Arizona, Florida, and Texas right now are exploding with coronavirus. So before baseball announced, hey, we're coming back, there was a lot of concern that where baseball wants to come back and other sports, basketball and right on down, Florida has been circled. And yet we've got these massive outbreaks that are going to need to be reckoned with that we can't just sweep under the carpet now that there's a deal in place. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's gonna, that's going to be the specter over, over the entire season is what happens if there's an outbreak. Does a team, I, and the protocols cover this to an extent. Um, but what if there's a massive outbreak? You know, we saw five Phillies players test positive. Um, other teams had players test positive. They're not saying how many. You know, the Yankees aren't saying. The uh, Blue Jays aren't saying. Um, the Giants aren't saying. They both had closed camps before Major League Baseball and ended up closing them all. So um, I, I think there's a distinct possibility we'll see the entire sport shut down again if, if trends don't reverse. And Jesse's right. The numbers are going up. The positive rates are like at 10% now in those states. And the stat I saw today was 31 states have, have actually rising uh, number of cases. And the number of cases is a lagging, it, it, it's a leading indicator of when people will be hospitalized later. So people say, well, they're not being hospitalized. Well, they will be. And you look at Arizona. You know, Arizona shot up, what, a couple weeks ago? Uh, people weren't being hospitalized. Now they're being hospitalized. ICU wards are getting pretty crowded in Arizona. So uh, I would not bet on the season ending. 
quite honestly, if I were betting them. Yeah, what gained attention in the first place back in March was Rudy Gobert of the Jazz. And now what just happened is Novak Djokovic, and it has hit tennis. So we'll see. Although it'd be great for baseball to come back and everyone to stay healthy and do what we can to keep the sport in the bubble. Mick, what you said that I wanted to come back to was the idea of the interest. You said, and you are spot on, that with us here, if there's baseball, we'll be in. What about the people who are not as big the baseball fans as us, the more casual fans, and what kind of damage has been done? And I'm really curious how this will be tracked, what interest baseball will have lost in the future because of the way that these negotiations occurred. Yeah, well, a couple things, too. Just going back to the corona, and then I'm going to jump back on this. We're, we're, I think what I read the other day were not deaths of coronavirus are 90% less than where they were, Right. And if you're 24 or under, you have a better chance of dying of a lightning bolt than, than dying of, of corona. So that's good for those young people. Now, I'm not in that group, but my aunt has it. Um, you know, talked about it. You, you had some family members with it. And she said, for her, it's been like pink eyes. So, so far, I've got my fingers crossed that it, that it stays that way. They're doing a lot more testing now. You know, like, because now that the hospitals are opening back up for, you know, uh, elective surgery, everybody that walks in there is getting tested. And, and, and it's a lot easier. You know, you can drive through here in, in Alabama and get it. And, you know, there's some spots like Houston where people were really were getting it in Florida. But it's a lot of young people that, that you know, are like, hey, look, I'm going out. I'm going to go to the bar. I'm going to do this. And, and, and they have very little uh, symptoms, you know, like, the, like uh, m- half of the people that died from it were in nursing homes, you know. So we've gotten smarter with it. I'm not saying I want to catch it. But, you know, the, I, I hope that, and I look, I don't know enough about it. I'm not a doctor, but I, I hope that what we're seeing is maybe we didn't realize how many people had it in the first place. And we, we know that young people, it really doesn't affect them. You know, so it, it's bad for certain people if you have a pre-existing condition, but maybe we could play baseball and not get it interrupted. But, um, you know, kind of going back to, uh, you know, the, the other thing that you were talking about, um, Hey, what were you talking about? Throw that at talking me again. About interest, oh, the, the fans. I'm right? sorry. Baseball is so good at keeping track of stats on the field. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious no, no. if any sabermetric, uh, sabermetricians track the interest with baseball returning. Yeah. And make sure what damage has been done. Yeah, look, a lot of damage has been done. Because the, the, the bottom line is this. You know, we're fur- I'm furloughed right now. You know, I don't know what your situation is, Kevin. I mean, I know you got your site going, but I'm sure that you've taken a hit. Jesse, you, you know, you're, you're taking a hit too. You know, all of us are taking a hit. And what makes uh, us a great country is that when things have happened in the past, like World War II, you know, it's like, hey, World War I the Cub- or World War II, the Cubs are going to get lights. But we needed to use that, that medal for, you know, for the war effort, right? So we don't have lights at our stadium, but there was a bigger cause there, you know. And I think what baseball's players have done, and, and the owners are part of this too, or Manfred or whatever, is that, is that we're all kind of just jumping in there and going, you know, it's not the situation that we want with our lives right now, but if I got to take a pay cut, you know, I know a lot of the people at the Cubs front office have, you know, talking to one of those guys the other day about it. Hey, look, we're, we're making 15, 20, 30% less. I'm, I'm taking less money because – there's less money there. And it's not just in baseball. It's all around. And then when you see one group that's like, you know what, we're not doing that. Or at least it's perceived that way. It turns off a lot of people that just are going, you know what, I don't care what the process is. I don't, I don't care about your negotiations in two years. Um, I'm, I'm over here trying to figure out how I'm going to get a job if I don't have one or I'm going to feed my family or my kids have been out of school for you know, almost a year now. Uh, I could really care less about this guy that's riding around on his, uh, you know, in his yacht and he's swimming in his in-ground pool in his mansion. You know, that, that's the perception that's out there. That's the damage that, that they're doing. Oh, well, it's just a billionaire owner. He's got $2 billion. Why can't he? You know, it, it seems like baseball is all about money. And it's not about playing a game. And it's not about the fans. And I, and I know, and I don't know what the, you know, the analytics are behind it, but I know that there's some damage that is being done right now to the game. I can guarantee it. Yeah, the union's done a bad job of, of, of uh, presenting their side. Uh, it took Bob, Bob Nightingale had a really interesting uh, uh, stat this morning. 
via Twitter, 19% of all the players will not receive another dollar this season because they received their full advances uh, up from March through May. 19% and another 12% will just get minimum amounts of money because they've been advanced so much by Major League Baseball. Uh, so there, there's a lot of weird stories going on, rich owners versus overpaid players. I mean, not everyone's Mike Trout. You know, right. not everyone's Garrett Cole. And, and so uh, that's going to be a big topic of discussion as we move forward. You know, what if you get hit with the coronavirus and you've already received your money for the year? You know, it's a miserable situation. It feels, Kevin, like remember a couple of weeks ago, whenever it was that we said, we're not yet at a point where we can pull ourselves back enough to truly understand the damage that has been done. And when I was using the word damage before, I was talking about fans and their opinion of the game. Now I'm using damage in terms of the economic impact on lives. What I would love to see, uh, and, and MLB really guards these numbers closely, is the effect on merchandise sales. You know, when merchandise sales are up, like when Garrett Cole signed with the Yankees, they made a huge deal about Garrett Cole jerseys going through the roof. You don't see them bragging about merchandise sales anymore, do you? Yeah. Well, with the Lansing Lugnuts, in terms of what can we do with our stadium closed, I'm just trying to send people to our retail store, saying at the very least you can shop online, and through that we can help support the community. All the proceeds from this shirt will go to this fund. All the proceeds for this, we'll send out tickets, we'll do whatever we can to connect ourselves with the community. Because you just don't have that much tie-in. You, you can't welcome people in, and there are teams that, yes, like Paw Sox, that serve folks food on the field. But by and large, you just don't get that same kind of interaction that you would. And you look at some of the major league teams, uh, there, there's a, a cascading effect. So the Yankees don't have games. That means all those, all those merchandise vendors surrounding Yankee Stadium are not selling to anyone. Same with the Red Sox. Look at Yaki Way. Everything across, not Yaki Way anymore, excuse me, whatever they call it. Um, all those merchandise vendors across the street from there closed, you know, no one's coming in to buy merch. And if no one's buying merch, that that's an indication. I think that people are not nearly as interested. I see a lot more interest in, and Twitter's not the world of course, but you know, all of a they sudden can... Russian soccer jerseys are hot and <laughs> you know, all this other alternative sports stuff is really hot. And once the NBA starts, I expect to see, uh, you know, some of that merch moved pretty well, and, and, and the NHL as well. Kevin, how has this affected the new arenas and new stadiums that they were looking at 2020 being their big year? You know, the arena world, you know, has not really been affected all that much. There were some, some construction delays, um, but overall construction has proceeded, you know, like the Islanders are building a new arena at Belmont Park. They're just plugging along. Um, in terms of minor league baseball, it's affected Worcester, Worcester a little bit. They've been delayed, um, and the development surrounding the ballpark has been delayed. Um, but development around ballparks gets delayed all the time. So and it's hard to say exactly what's due to the to play not happening or due to the normal economics of, of big development. Um, but we're, we're seeing things move forward. And I expect to, uh, you know, and in MLS, you know, the new Cincinnati stadium will open on time next year. No problem. Is league health good? We know how things are with minor league baseball, major league baseball, and the different circuits of baseball. Um, there have been different circuits of soccer trying to get a toehold. How are things looking? Boy, MLS is fine. I think overall they've had some layoffs in front offices, but they let, ran pretty lean to begin with. And with the season resuming in, in Florida, they'll be on TV, which is their big thing right now. USL, they're going to try to play home games, whether fans are allowed in or not. And I just question that, that uh, the economics of the game allowing for, for few or no fans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you hear that in some areas you can have 25% capacity. Well, okay, you can have that capacity, but will people actually show up? That's going to be the big issue. And there's a lot of, lot of, uh, doubts about about moving forward. MLS at one point wanted to suspend its USL operations. Um, I, I don't know if that's been resolved or not. I don't think it has been. Um, so 
you know, uh, the WNBA is playing a centralized tournament in Florida as well. They're not taking anyone on the road. I think, you know, baseball will end up looking more like a pod system than we think. You know, there, there's talk about really the, like having an LA San Diego pod and not really going to Seattle all that much. And, you know, there's been whispers about it. That's why we don't see a schedule yet. So you could see even more regionalized play than just the 10 division, the three divisions with 10 teams each. All those logistics that need to be ironed out. Yeah. The baseball thesaurus term that I chose for this week. So we talked about pitchers. Uh, so it's a pitching term. We also talked about what was needed and could they escape. I chose Houdini and a Houdini act. Mm. A Houdini is a pitcher who gets himself out of a jam. Specifically, a Houdini act is bases loaded, nobody out, and the pitcher escapes without anybody scoring. And I found my favorite Houdini act to share with you two. And then I'd love to hear, Mick, about your recollections on some great Houdinis and what that term means to you. But... 1927 World Series. 1927 was the Murderer's Row Yankees. Murderer's Row Yankees took on which National League team in the World Series? Athletics? Not the Athletics. Chil Big uh, Poison, Little Poison, Pie Trainer, and the oh, Pittsburgh Pirates. Pirates, yeah. Okay. So the Pirates lost the first three games because they're taking on Murderer's Row. But in the bottom of the ninth, game four, they're playing in Pittsburgh. It's tied up three to three. Earl Combs walks, Mark Koenig singles, and then an intentional walk is given to Babe Ruth because of course. Uh, all right, so now we got bases loaded. So, bases loaded, nobody out. Johnny Milgis is on the mound for the Pittsburgh Pirates, taking on Lou Gehrig, Bob Musil on deck, Tony Lazari in the hole. He strikes out Gehrig. He strikes out Bob Musil. And then with the chance to send things to extra innings and keep the pirate season alive, he throws a wild pitch. And that brings uh, in Hulk Holmes. And that is how the Pirates lost the World Series. That is my favorite near Houdini act in baseball history. Hmm. They were going to lose anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They had no chance. They weren't beating that Yankees team. I said it was in Pittsburgh. No, it was in New York because the Yankees were the home team. But yeah, can you imagine? Yeah. Bases loaded. It's game. Four. It's an elimination game. Strikeout. Strikeout. Oh, wild pitch. Season over. Yeah, you talk about Houdini. That's another one of my favorite terms to use. And right off the bat, I, I think about 2009, Ryan Sandberg's uh, Smokey's manager. He's got this list of you know, three things on his, like on the wall in the clubhouse that at the time I wasn't allowed to talk about as a broadcast. Like Rhino was like, listen, you're allowed in here. You're one of us. I don't want you talking about this. And the reason why is that Rhino had money that he would pay out of his pocket to certain guys if they were able to, um, you know, to, to do things in a situation to help their team. You know, so like one of them was like, Look, I'll give you 50 bucks if you can hit a, if you hit a fly ball that's caught, but you're at second base. You got to touch second before the the ball is caught, right? So you're, I mean, think about it. You're you're like, well, you know what? I just flew out, but if I can get to second base before that guy catches the ball, he's gonna give me 50 bucks. You're always hustling, right? Well, the other one, one of the other ones, I can't remember the third one, but I know this one for a fact. If you were a reliever and you inherited the bases loaded with no one out, and you got the Houdini without giving up a run, 100 bucks. So, like, the, every day I'm looking at it, and I'm going, okay, who's going to make the 100 bucks here? You know, like, even though I'm not allowed to talk about it. And it happened. It happened one time. Uh, we were in Mobile, and Greg Maddox was, was, uh, was there watching. You know, like, he was, like, an assistant for the Cubs. And, uh, and I saw, and, and he, and, you know, and it comes in and gets out of the situation. Somebody comes in and gets out of the situation. hundred bucks from Rhino for doing it. The Houdini, you know, but you could be a Houdini and walk the bases loaded and then get the next three outs, which I think that's more likely to me than being a reliever that comes in and, and gets the outs. Uh, but it's a great term. My dad used to talk about Houdini all the time. I mean, he was like, 
a, a, a Houdini super fan, you know, and he would tell me about the, the real Houdini and, you know, he's like in, in a, you know, in a suit and they drop him in water and he's chained in there and somehow he like unchains himself and gets out of the water and, you know, <laughs> So like I had to like Google this guy like a long time ago because I had heard so many stories about all the amazing stuff that he did, you know. So one of the great, uh, you know, great names of all time, and and I I love that term, one of my favorites. So let me ask you, Mick did did the Smokies win the game? Uh, yes, sure. I <laughs> I, would I, don't, I don't know, that. Kevin. I'm, I would I would I love so, that corresponding with a Houdini leading to a win. Yeah. Because in my I, mind, I, that, that gives you some momentum. I, I think that they did win. Uh, just kind of off the top of my head. Sure. But, yeah, I think that they did. Uh, and that would have been – what happens in the course of a game, it, when, when you load the bases with no outs and don't score, it is a momentum killer. You know, like, it, it just does. I, I don't know why. I mean, how many times, Jesse, have you seen it where some a team loads the bases and doesn't score? And then – they don't get a hit the rest of the game. Yeah, that's your chance. Oh, looking back in retrospect, just killer. About that, too. You and I know relievers. There was this idea I had before I entered baseball that baseball players are cool, calm, and collected. That you go in, you're confident. And no, your heart is pounding in your chest. When these guys are called upon in big spots, they're nervous, and you hope that nervousness pushes them forward, gets the adrenaline flowing, and helps them do good things. But they are stressed. So I love that idea that rather than a reliever getting called upon with a base loaded, nobody out and gone, oh, no. Uh, like, I'll try my best, but this is terrible. I love that idea of the relievers going, I hope he calls on me. I could use that 100 bucks. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, we don't see those guys very long, Jesse. I mean, if, if – if you're the kind of reliever that comes into those games and gets out of those situations, you're normally moving up. And, you know, and going back to something else that kind of is along the same lines, you know, we were talking about the inherited runner at second base, you know, in extra innings. Uh, Cubs have a guy, Dakota Meckes, who's one of their top minor league relievers or whatever. Michigan He's the best State. ever. Yeah, right, exactly. He's the best ever saw getting out of those situations. You know, it was like he'd come into the game, guy at second, and – just somehow he just didn't give up a hit, you know, uh, and, and we'll get the out. You know, I, I think one time he picked off the guy at second or he strike out the guy at the plate, you know, and, and in, in those situations when you, when you inherit that runner or you've got a bases loaded, no outs spot, the biggest weapon you have as a pitcher is the strikeout. You get a strikeout, nothing good's happening for the offense. You know, you could ground out in that situation and get the run in. So if you don't let them make contact, you know they're they're uh, hurting. Hey, do you guys, uh, you guys hear the, uh, the 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 bad weather behind me? Oh you? yeah, it's coming through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So a little you know coastal uh, storm out here as I sit on the porch. <laughs> There's the opposite story that I remember reading as a kid in a book of baseball anecdotes. I think Mel Ott was the Giants manager, and he had placed a fine on any pitcher who struck out a batter on 0-2, because his feeling was. If the count is no balls and two strikes, you got to waste one. You can't give the batter anything fat. You absolutely can't give anything hittable on 0-2. And the story goes that a pitcher, count went to nothing and two. He threw a pitch. He was trying to waste it. And the umpire rang up the batter on strikes. The pitcher runs down off the mound to get in the face of the umpire to shout at him. It was clearly high. What are you talking about? The pitch was up there. Yeah, I, I think that's bad. I, it's funny how the game has changed so much since Mel Ott is managing. Like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Look, I know you don't want to give up hits on a two-strike pitch, right? You don't. But it doesn't matter. It, it's all about getting the out. Yeah, you might have a pitch. to you, You've got three pitches to use, but it doesn't mean that you can't use it. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it does it, – it doesn't matter. Every single situation is different. You know, you throw, you, say you spin a couple breaking balls up there and, you know, you get ahead 0-2. Like maybe you slot a fastball in there and, and sneak it by him, strike three. Maybe you throw another breaking ball that's, 
you know, that's going to be a strike. And, and, and you know this particular hitter is, is going to take. And to think – I know in the minors, Jesse, and you know what I'm talking about, there's organizations that have a rule that you're not allowed to swing at 3-0. And so when you're playing them, you're like, hey, look, I know that I can throw the ball straight down the middle of the plate and they, they're not allowed to swing at it. So how does, you know, how does that make you a better hitter when you're taking one of your opportunities away to drive the baseball? The best pitch you might see is on three balls and no strike. I've told this story about Andy Sunstein before. I, that – that the Tampa Bay Rays said he could not throw more than six innings in a game because he kept on throwing seven, eight, nine. So he threw six innings, 40 some pitches. And it's like, how did this help us? So it's, nope. yes, individual players, individual things. By the way, a quote about Warren Spahn that I think fits this situation perfectly. Warren Spahn said a pitcher needs two pitches, one they're looking for and one to cross them up. And that's it. It's a simple game, right? What's the batter expecting? Okay, don't give him that. Yeah, Mick, stay safe. Oh, I'm good. You guys keep going. I'm going to walk inside here, and we're going to jump right back to where we were. It was the quote about coronavirus that, right, it's, you're more likely to get struck by lightning than bad coronavirus, but don't mess with the lightning. Yes, yes. That, that's now the danger, not the coronavirus. For that. <laughs> yeah. I was, I, I was, it's exactly what I was thinking. Like, I might as well just come on inside here for the rest of the show because I, the only thing I was missing out there was the lightning. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> stay safe, stay dry. All right, so here we go. We're at the very end of June. We're heading to the start of July. If this were a normal baseball season, we would be seeing all-star games at certain levels. We would be seeing the short season teams would be starting up their season. It's a very unusual, unprecedented set of circumstances. So it is fun to see how teams are continuing to go about their business. And there are teams that are reading their summer wooden bat league, uh, checking out what's going on in Texas and the wooden bat leagues that are going. I see on Ballpark Digest, Kevin, the North Woods League is going regional with Minnesota and Iowa. Yep, added a uh, Minnesota, uh, added a, uh, another pod with some Minnesota and Iowa teams. Um, the Futures League will be playing, although with, a, with, a, with fewer teams, um, and they're going to allow fans in. in. In Iowa, they're allowed to, and in Minnesota, they can allow some fans in. It's still, it's still limited. Um, I, I think it's wonderful that they're, they're trying to do play this season, but I, I guess I understand the likes of the Cape Cod and the West Coast League saying, no, we're not even going to bother. Uh, they've got states that are still very prohibited in terms of allowing fans in. Uh, and then there's no minor league baseball. And, and, and like we've talked about, no one expects it this year anyway. And I think it's a virtually done deal, and I expect it to be announced uh, in the next week. Yeah, that's the thing, right? So Mick, Tennessee Smokies, me, Lansing Lugnuts. Um, major League Baseball has now come to, especially by 5 p.m. today, the agreement. So at what point do we get that minor league baseball announcement sometime this week, perhaps? You know, I think, I think there's been even more of an unofficial word than we've heard. Um, like there was a news item, which I haven't written about yet, that Daytona laid off a bunch of its, half of its front office, including Ryan Kerr. So, you know, when you lay off your team president, uh, that's sort of an indication that, that you don't expect to play this year. And that's a unique situation because Ryan also owns uh, – the Burlington team in the Appy League, which is sure to become the, the Burlington team in the Coastal Plain League at some point, I'm guessing. So you're going to see a lot of adjustments like that uh, and a lot more, a lot more layoffs. And, you know, this was supposed to be the weekend, I believe, coming up of Daytona hosting the Florida State League All-Star Game. Yeah. And they've turned that into promotion where they're going to honor community heroes. Good. Um, and they're working hard at it. And I really give those guys a lot of credit, guys and, and uh, gals in the front office. God, I hate that term. I shouldn't even use it. The people. The, the, people, the, in, the people in the front office are doing a lot of work to, uh, to, to make that promotion happen. And you're seeing that in a lot of minor league front offices as well. Well, we're all rooting for a Houdini. Any final thoughts, Mick Gillespie? 
you know, the, the fact that we're not going to have minor league baseball, I just totally did not see this coming at the beginning of this. You know, I, I was on a radio show and they asked me and I said, ah, no, we'll play. I was so wrong about just everything that has transpired with this, you know, and it's, it's been disappointing. You know, it's sad to, to think that we're, we're not going to have uh, baseball in the minor leagues. You know, we're, we're still not 100% certain about having it in the big leagues. You know, at least Kevin, we got some, you know, uh, college wood bat leagues that are going to play. And, you know, we can always watch teams from South Korea and now Japan. So <laughs> Been a bad year. I love Korea baseball. Around. I gotta yeah, admit, right. I've been yeah. getting up at weird times to watch it. So I gotta admit, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, but I, I'm with you, Mick. It's it's just it's just sort of sad, and I and I understand why why they would shut down minor league baseball. It's just safety concerns alone. You know, imposing standards on every minor league team. In the majors, it's a little easier to do because you've got the big facilities and the major league ballparks to to deal with there's a whole lot of difference between a clubhouse in, in, in Comerica Park and a clubhouse in Lansing, you know, in terms of social distancing and keep, in terms of keeping people safe. So um, I, I, I totally agree with you, Mick. I didn't see this coming to this extent either. Um, I, I think it's a, a warning that uh, we're going to see some change next year too, in terms of social distancing and how ballparks are run. I posted on the Lugnuts Facebook wall yesterday question that I've been wondering about how fans were going to answer. I was simply, what do you miss most about not having lug nuts baseball? I, and I was thinking maybe people would say the atmosphere, the baseball, the food, the whatever it might be. And person after person after person wrote everything. The whole thing is what they all miss. And this, this goes, this person, this person, this, whatever it means to them individually, it's the whole big picture, and that's what we're all missing right now. Mick Gillespie, big thanks. Kevin Reichard, big thanks. This has been the Ballpark Digest broadcaster chat. Thanks to you. Go to ballparkdigest.com, check out the site, sign up for the newsletter. Until next week. Thanks, Jesse. That was fun, guys. <laughs>